It's my honor today to be here representing the entire Berkeley DB Sleepy Cat software team. I'd like to start with a thank you to the SIGMOD Awards Committee for bestowing this honor upon us, and also to everyone who's ever used Berkeley DB, whether it was in a product, for a research study, or just for your own use. Without you, we wouldn't be here today. So I say I'm here on behalf of a team. Let me introduce you to the team. It started in 1996 with me and Keith Bostick. In 1997, we hired our first consultants, Carol Sandstrom did support, Don Anderson developed our C++ and Java APIs. Carol later went on to become a full-time support engineer with Sleepy Cat. In 1998, we made perhaps our best hire. We hired our first full-time employee, Mike Olson. He joined us as VP of sales, ultimately became our CEO, and led us through the entire Sleepy Cat existence up through the acquisition. In 1999, we hired our first real database engineer in the name of Mike Bell. Next up was Susan Laverso, who came and joined on to develop our HA product. That was followed quickly by Michael Call, who also joined the core team, and then John Merrills, who developed our XML product. 2002 was a big year for us. We hired Greg Bird into core engineering. Linda Lee and Charlie Lamb joined us to develop our Java product. David Seglo was our first VP engineering, real engineering manager. And Steve Sarret was our first professional documentation writer. Next up, we added George Feinberg to the XML team. Mark Hayes had developed an open source collections API on top of our Java API, so we hired him. Next up was Ron Cohen, our next full-time support engineer. And then we added Alan Bram on our HA project as well as David Schachter in the general core area. And then finally in 2006, right before the acquisition, we hired Alexander Garad, another Australian. And of course in 2006, we were acquired by Oracle. Now, one of the great things about building a product for engineers is that you actually get to know your customers really well. And there are some customers who were truly instrumental in the history of Sleepy Cat and in the development of Berkeley DB. First and foremost, David Borham and Tim Howes were the people who brought us into Netscape, helped us structure the first deal, which I'll tell you about in a little bit. Chris Newcomb and Sharon Pearl were instrumental in helping us get our high availability product out the door. Chris was at Valve at the time, later moved to Amazon, brought Berkeley DB with him there. Sharon was at Google, and they worked very closely with us to make sure that our high availability product was indeed highly available. And then finally, Anton Okmiansky was at Cisco and helped us really understand the embedded market and brought us into the networking world. Finally, Sleepy Cat was a company, not just a product. And it was the entire sales and marketing team that really transforms Berkeley DB, the product, into Sleepy Cat, the company. So a big thank you to them. And then there were the adults in the room. So Barry Dicker and Amy Mastro Batista were our lawyers. Mary and Bruce Tiedemann was our accounting firm, and John Prendergast and Richard Vieira helped us do the deal with Oracle. So on behalf of the entire team, thank you, one and all. I'm gonna split the rest of the talk into two parts. I'm gonna give you a brief history of how did Berkeley DB and Sleepy Cat software happen, and then I'm gonna talk about some of the lessons we learned that are perhaps different from what you might learn from other companies. So it all started when I was in grad school and took a graduate database course from Michael Stonebreaker, and I thought dynamic and sensible hashing was really cool, and Keith Bostick needed an unencumbered replacement for HSearch, DBM, and NDBM because he was in the process of trying to free the entire Unix user-level distribution from copyright. So um, he had an ulterior motive, too. He wanted to build NVI, and he needed a record package that would sit underneath NVI. Now, Mike Olson had worked at a couple of companies, and every time he joined a company, the first thing they asked him to do was build a B tree. So Keith said, hey, Mike, build one more B tree. We'll ship it with 4.4 BSD, and you'll never have to write another one again. So in fact, we released version zero under the name of Hash, which was just the replacement for HSearch, DBM, and NDBM. Then when we got Mike to write the B tree implementation, we unified the hash and vtree implementations under the moniker of db and then we turned it all over to keith who transformed it into db185 which was a robust stable implementation of this generic database layer on top of these hash and vtree access methods 
Now, Mike and I were graduate students, and I'd really been wanting to do a transactional version of this for quite a while. So Mike and I wrote a paper in 1992 called LibTP, which added transactional support to DB185, but it did in a very Unixy fashion in that we had separate modules for transaction management, and buffer management, and locking and logging. So sort of what you get when you put Unix together with transaction processing. Then life happened. I graduated, I went off and got a job. Keith went off and joined BSDI. Mike needed to get a master's degree. And so between 1993 and 1996, while we weren't paying a lot of attention, weird things happened. So people started using DB185 for things like browser bookmarks, which seemed fine. And then they started using it to store credit card data, which did not seem fine at all, because DB185 as released had no transactional support. And then the team from the University of Michigan picked it up to use inside the LDAP server. And the LDAP server ultimately became the Netscape LDAP server. So in 1996, Netscape came looking for the libtp code, and we had to sort of, you know, embarrassingly admit that it was really grad student code and not ready for prime time. They said, well, we'd, we'd really like it, you know, we'd, we'd pay for it. And Keith and I had been really excited about the idea of building a real production quality libtp, essentially. And so on the basis of that, we started Sleepy Cat Software in 1996. In a frantic nine month frenzy, we developed the first release. So Berkeley DB 2.0 was released by Sleepy Cat Software in 97. And the way to think about this product is that it was the first commercially viable key value store, but it's really the heart of every relational database is this storage manager inside that provides transactional semantics on top of storage. Or, as I said before, it's really what happens when you take a bunch of Unix weenies and a bunch of database weenies and sort of ram them together at high speed. So two years later, 1999, we released Berkeley DB 3.0. This was really a retooling of all the APIs, much more object oriented. We introduced C++ and Java APIs that didn't make C++ and Java programmers kind of ill because our first cut at that wasn't very good, mostly because Keith and I weren't willing to listen to Don Anderson, who knew what we should be doing. And then in 2001, we introduced 4.0, which is our HA product, or high availability. Now, you might notice something really interesting about this timeline. We hit the first dot-com bubble right in the sweet spot. Our product matured just as every first-generation web company was looking for a robust, reliable transactional store. Keith has always said that it's better to be lucky than good. And I'd like to think that we were in fact good, but we were in fact also very lucky. And so it was that dot-com boom that made Berkeley DB the key technology that underlay all first generation um, internet services. So in our heyday, we followed up in 2003 with our XML product which was full native XML support, the XQuery API. And then in 2004, our Java product, clean slate design, designed from scratch to embrace the Berkeley DB philosophy in a way that was native to Java programmers. It used a novel log structured storage system. Gosh, can't imagine where they got that from. And this is in fact the product that underlies today's Oracle NoSQL database. And then of course, 2006, we were acquired by Oracle. Now there's a story I like to tell that um, the structure of our deal was something called a reverse double merger. And the last step of that is a merger. So we're on the phone with the Oracle folks and Keith and I are talking and they're explaining the reverse double merger. And when they explain that last merger stage, Keith chimes in and says, so what do we call the merged company? And he and I are kind of chuckling because this is clearly a joke, but the person on the other end did not realize this was a joke. And there's this long pause, you know, like, well, um, that would be Oracle. And, you know, so we got off the phone and said, well, maybe we could just get whiskers in the O. So there's our fantasy uh, logo that Oracle should have had. I promised that I would wrap up with some lessons learned. And I want to focus on things that I thought were sort of unique about Sleepy Cat. So one, we were fully distributed work from home company. Who knew that a decade and a half later, that would be like a really great skill set. Um, number two, we were self-funded. I'll talk a little bit about that. Number three, we were open source before it was cool and before most of our customers even knew what that was. 
And we were an engineering driven company in a really great sense of the word. So let me just touch on those three things very briefly. What does it mean to be organically grown? Well, it means you never take outside venture. And there's both good sides and bad sides. From my point of view, it was really joyful. We ran the company the way we wanted to. We treated employees like they were family. Heck, when we interviewed people, they stayed in our home. Even Mark Hayes, who it turns out was allergic to cats, and I didn't find this out for a decade. But we got to really determine our own trajectory, our own growth, and we grew with our customers. On the other hand, it's also super challenging. Number one, people will tell you you're idiots, and maybe they're right. You really don't get the same respect that you get when you're a venture-backed rocket ship. And you have to really carefully manage growth because there's payroll to be made every month. And you will do stupid things. I am embarrassed to admit how long we gave support away for free before we realized that it was a huge revenue stream. So you can do it. You can build a company organically, but it's a totally different model. And I wouldn't trade it for anything. As I said, we were open source before it was cool. We were also dual licensed which means we both were open source, but we were also proprietary depending on the product we were shipping in. So this was before open source got really complicated. And like organic growth, there are really two sides to it. So the advantage is that you get lots of adoption. So Berkeley DB ships inside of tons of open source things, even today, every version of Linux, every version of BSD, glibc, et cetera, et cetera. On the other hand, in order to make that work, you spend a lot of time talking to lawyers. You spend a lot of time talking to other open source projects to make sure your licenses are compatible. And sometimes your customers get angry, at least back then, because they didn't really understand the open source model. On the other hand, I don't think it would have happened if we hadn't been an open source product. And finally, I said we were engineering driven, and I think we were engineering driven in exactly the right way. So Keith has this mantra that the kind of bugs you need to avoid are the ones that give your customers not only the inclination, but the time to hunt you down. So if you are in the data management business, your number one mantra is do not lose data, right? We do not want to be on the front page of the New York Times for losing stock exchange data. That would be really bad. If you're an open source product, people read your code. So your code had better look good. And we enforced coding standards brutally. We reviewed every line of code that anybody ever committed. And we took great pride when somebody literally told us that our code was a pleasure to read. Now, if you have a small engineering team, you have a choice. You can spend your time fixing bugs or designing new features. We all know that designing new features is more fun. But if you're one of these database projects and you want to design new features, you better make sure that your code base is robust. And so engineering really, really matters. So that's what I wanted to talk about. Once again, we are delighted to be here. Um, I love the people show you here on the slide. We built a great product. We built a great company. I think we had a lot of fun doing it. And um, one of the best parts of this award is the opportunity for me to get in touch with all these people again. So on behalf of the Sleepy Cat team, thank you.